morning. It's, uh, it's nice to be able to have this opportunity of sharing God's Word with you. I'm David Earnshaw and as you know I used to live in Swindon but now up here in the north of England doing mission work uh, on the Fylde coast. It's really nice to have this opportunity to come and open God's Word for you on this uh, anniversary Sunday. We're living in very strange and uh, difficult days but thank God because of technology then we can learn to communicate with each other. I was going to say it's nice to see you, but I can't see anybody, but I'm sure that you can see me. You may think I'm slightly overdressed for an occasion like this. I really didn't want to show up your pastor. I know he sometimes preaches without a tie, but uh, we won't go down that road. But I've just come from a funeral. I've just come from burying my next door neighbor, a man who had uh, 90 years of life and uh, was a Welshman. But he came from a small hamlet called Pont Robert. You say, what's significant about that? Well, from Pont Robert came three significant people. One was a man called John Hughes, a famous Welsh preacher. Then a man called John Davis, who then became a very significant missionary in his day and generation. And also Anne Griffith. She wrote the, the words for the Welsh version of Cumranda. And, uh, and from this incredibly small hamlet in the middle of nowhere, that's where my next door neighbor came from. And it was a pleasure to know him, but a very sad occasion, just three of us at the funeral, uh, his, his widow uh, and my wife, Jane, and myself. But it was a great opportunity to share the gospel. So that's why I, I'm dressed like this. I've literally just come from there. But anyway, I trust there's nothing funereal about what I've got to say this morning. So let's open our Bibles to the second book of Kings, chapter six. Second book of Kings, chapter 6, and I'm going to read from verse 24 right through to verse 2 of chapter 7. This will help us get a feeling as to what the passage is all about and, and, and give us a taste. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. There was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed they besieged it until the donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. Then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, What is troubling you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we'll eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Now it happened when the king heard the word of the words of the woman that he tore his clothes. And as he passed by on the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Then he said, God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. But Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man ahead of him, but before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still talking with them, there was the messenger coming down to him. And then the king said, surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow, about this time, a seer of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Well, this is God's word and we thank him for it. You say, what a strange passage for a visiting speaker to speak on, especially in relation to our anniversary Sunday. What are you going to say about this? 
Well, I want to speak about wardrobe malfunctions. I'm sure you've heard that expression before. People talk about it in the world of entertainment and in the world of the media, where sometimes people are on stage and a piece of their clothing becomes detached or torn, and it's slightly embarrassing for them and for those watching, and it's called a wardrobe malfunction. Here in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 30, we read of the king having a wardrobe malfunction, but it was something he was aware of. I'm not saying he planned it, but because of a certain situation, we're told out of grief that was in his heart, he tore his garment. And as his royal robe was ripped underneath, the people saw that he was wearing a hair shirt or sackcloth. And you can almost hear this quiet gasp. What? The king is wearing a hair shirt? Well, that's what I want to speak about for a few minutes this morning, if you would permit me. All this took place in the days when Jehoram was king of Israel. You know how the nation divided into two? You had Jerusalem in the south, which was the capital of, of Judah, the southern part of the nation. And then you had Israel in the north, with Samaria as its capital. Generally speaking, Israel was always in a bad spiritual state. And this passage takes place when Jehoram was king of Israel. His parents were Ahab and Jezebel. You could not get a worse start in life than having those two as your parents. He was basically the son of murderers. Well, he was the king. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, took it upon himself to come and attack Samaria. And so, as was typical in those days, he sent down the troops who blocked off all the main roads in and out of the city, and they just sat there waiting for the city to shrivel and to die. And then when people were weak and emaciated and hungry, he would then go in for the kill and make it a lot easier. Just so happened that one of the people inside of the city was a man called Elisha, that, that great prophet of God that we read of so often in the book of Kings. Well, the famine came and it started to bite and the troops sat outside the walls. We're given a little insight to what was going on inside the city. For example, we're told that when the famine really took hold, a donkey's head was being sold for either eight or 80 shekels. There's a slight variation there in the text over, over figures, but, but whatever, eight or 80, that's not the point. The thing is, a donkey's head. Now, a donkey is an unclean animal. So for a start, you shouldn't be eating it in the first place. And if you do want to eat donkey, there's a lot of difference between eating a donkey steak or donkey ribs, but a donkey's head, I mean, donkey's heads are for scrubbing. You kind of scratch them there, not for eating. There isn't much meat. And yet we're told, for all this amount of money, people were buying a head to sort of nibble on. They were pretty desperate days. And then we're told a very strange thing, that the dove's droppings were being sold to be eaten. Now, scholars are very kind of uh, divided over what this actually means, and I don't want to go into great detail because if they don't know, I'm quite certain I don't know. But what we're talking about here is between half a pint and a pint. Now, I know that's imperial measurement, but hey, look at me. Do you expect me to start using metric measurements? But you know what half a pint is or a pint. Well, that also was being sold for a large sum of money. And whatever it was, it sounds pretty despicable and doesn't whet the appetite. And then we're told there was cannibalism. Now, Ezekiel, who, who came at a later date, he announced that when Jerusalem fell, that there would be cannibalism. And so here's Ezekiel, he's up by the river Kibar in Babylon, speaking about what was going to happen in Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. He said, cannibalism will come there. And sure enough, it did. And you've only got to read the book of Lamentations where Jeremiah indicates that when Jerusalem fell, people were actually eating each other. Now, when you turn to the Old Testament, to Leviticus chapter 26 and also Deuteronomy chapter 28, God spelled out very clearly to Moses, listen, when your people and my people start eating one another, take this as a sign of my judgment. And so it's pretty clear that that Samaria, the capital of Israel, was, was under judgment and they were desperate days. Now it's against this backcloth that we're told that the king one day was, was walking by and he heard two women arguing. 
And one of the ladies shot out to him and said, Your Majesty, could you please help us with this dilemma? He stopped and said, well, what's your dilemma? Well, I don't think he was ready for what he was about to hear. One of these ladies said, well, listen, you know things are difficult, Your Majesty. We made an agreement that, that we'd have my son today for a meal, and then the following day we'd have this lady's son. Well, yesterday we cooked my son and we, we ate and we're still here. Now it's time for, for her son to, to be eaten. She's hidden him. Well, the last thing the king wanted to do was to get involved in, in this kind of moral discussion as to the rights and wrongs of eating your son. But what we're told, he was deeply grieved by what he heard. And what he heard so affected him made him tear his royal robes. Were they purple? I don't know. But we know that kings wore different clothes from the average person in the street, the high polite. And as he tore his clothes, the people on the wall gasped. The king has got a hair shirt underneath his royal robe. And it's interesting, isn't it? Maybe people thought it's all right for the king in his palace. He's fine. You know, he's, he's well looked after. He's, he's not living the kind of life that we have to live down at the bottom. But no, this revealed that even though the king was in the palace and maybe living at a different kind of level, he felt their pain. Hence the reason why he wore sackcloth. He wore her shirt. In fact, it almost seems there's more compassion in the king's heart than was in the heart of these women, especially in relation to their children. You see, once you start eating your children, you're eating your inheritance. I mean, your children are your inheritance. They are your future. So if you're eating your children, what future have you got? It's like, it's like time. Have you realized this? The only thing you've got is now. And, and if there's one expression that I find deeply disturbing, it's when folk tell me they are killing time. Don't kill time. It's the only thing you've got. Make the best of the time that God has given you. And so here are these ladies arguing over tomorrow. And the king is so grieved. He shows just how he feels by the tearing of his garment and the revealing of the sackcloth. Now we mustn't get too spiritual about this. <laughs> he was still a godless man. I mean, he, he was a terrible king. He was a few notches up from his mother and father, Ahab and Jezebel. But at heart he was still <laughs> a godless man. But he had compassion. And sometimes we can be under this false impression but Christians are full of compassion and non-Christians have no clue what it's about. Believe me, even during COVID-19 and all that's been going on in our nation for the past 10 months, we've all seen some remarkable compassion, even coming out of the hearts of atheists and agnostics and people who have no time for the things of God. I went into one of our local shops to speak to a man that I know there are about some electrical appliance that we have in our house that wasn't working. And as he began to speak about what was going on in the nation, he welled up with tears. He, he said, Mr. Renshaw, it moves me to think of what people are going through. He said, and sometimes I can't sleep. And, and this man has told me quite clearly, he doesn't believe. He's no time for the things of God. But he had a heart for people. It's a kind of challenge to us as Christian people. And so here's a man, he's not a godly man at all. He's a terrible king. None of us would like to sit under his reign. And yet he cared for his people. Hence the reason why he wore this hair shirt underneath his royal robes. You say, well, what on earth can you say about that? Is that all that you've come online, as it were, to speak about? Ripping your garments and, and wearing a hair shirt? Come on, it's an anniversary. As I've been thinking about this story in the Bible, this true account over these past couple of weeks, two different lines of thought have come to me. First of all, I want to speak about this man in relation to life in general. And then secondly, as I begin to bring things to a close, I'd like us to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. We must always think about our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's everywhere throughout the Word of God. And as I think of this king tearing his garment, there are four practical things I'd like to say to you. The first thing to say is this, all of us have our sorrows. At first value, you may think the king had no sorrows whatsoever. After all, he is the king. You know, whatever he wants, he gets. He's right at the top of the tree. But no, even when he tears his royal robe, you suddenly realize underneath the robe, there's a hair shirt. 
the sackcloth. And is this not true of life? It doesn't matter what your station in life is, all of us have our sorrows. Nobody is exempt from them. Remember those days many, many years ago when Charles and Diana got married? Charles was the envy of just about every man in the nation. Wow, how's he got her? She's wonderful, so attractive. It was the perfect marriage, marriage made in heaven. Plates, cups, mugs, tea towels, you name it. And then out came the story. Anything but a marriage made in heaven. And even at the heart of Buckingham Palace, we then began to realize there was sorrow in that home. We've seen it recently in relation to other royal marriages. Remember the Queen having that terrible year? Windsor Castle, severely damaged by, by fire and other things going wrong in life. And she spoke about having a terrible year. My dear friends, whether you are a king or a queen, or whether you're just an ordinary person going on with life, you will have your sorrows. And all of us, underneath this kind of exterior that looks fine, that looks like we're coping well, if, absolutely tr if absolute truth were known, all of us have got our sorrows. And I guess everyone who's listening to this this morning, you may look fine on the outside, but believe me, I've been a pastor for 35 years. You have sorrows. I've got them. You've got them. Remember the words of Eliphaz? Eliphaz was answering Job in chapter 5 of that terrific book. And, and, and Eliphaz said, Job, can I tell you something? Man is born to trouble, as sure as the sparks fly upwards. Or to put it another way, men and women will always have sorrows as sure as life exists. You have it here in this passage, you have it there in the book of Job. Think of Eli. Remember the high priest that Samuel was sent to work alongside to learn one or two things and it was then that God spoke to Samuel because he had a word to give to Eli about his sons. You'd have thought a man in such a position would, would be fine. Oh no, his sons broke his heart. And God gave Samuel a word to give to Eli about his sons. How humiliating is that? And then when you read on in the life of Samuel, why even Samuel's sons grieved his heart because of the way that they turned away from the Lord. My dear friends, none of us are exempt from sorrows, no matter how fine our outside delivery may appear. We know about Charles Wesley, we sing his hymns on a regular basis. Do you know his son became a Roman Catholic? What a heavy sorrow that was for Charles Wesley to bear as he's preaching and writing these wonderful hymns about the gospel and we sing them still 250 years later, yet at the same time his heart is breaking over what happens to his son. We know that John and Charles were part of a large family and one of their sisters had a child out of wedlock. It's pretty embarrassing, isn't it, when your brothers are Anglican clergymen and they're going around the country preaching the gospel of God's grace and God's mercy and the power of the Holy Spirit and you go and let the family down by having a child out of wedlock? How do you cope with that in terms of credibility? I guess you've all heard the preacher, you've Ron Dunn. The most interesting communicator. I remember reading his biography a couple of years ago, very moving. Ron Dunn, his son committed suicide. How do you explain that when you're a pastor? You see, as pastors, you're meant to have it all together, aren't you? You know, the perfect wife, the perfect family, the perfect home, the perfect look, the perfect smile, the nice haircut. Everyone's got it right. Oh, look at that man. And yet here's a man pastoring and preaching to hundreds, yet he takes his own life. And I could give you illustration after illustration from my own pastoral life. The people in the congregations that I've pastored whose lives on the inside have been very sorrowful indeed. On the outside, you would never notice a thing. But on the inside, things have gone so drastically wrong that it's been incredibly painful. People whose children have been in prison. People whose children have taken their own lives. People who've had relatives murdered and yet still kept coming to church, still putting on their best, still looking normal. But underneath the sorrow, just like this king, 
And therefore, here's the first thing I want to say. All of us have our sorrows. And whatever your sorrow is this morning, whatever is the hair shirt or the sackcloth that you're wearing, you need to know this. You're not on your own. You are not on your own. James Dobson became famous for writing all his books about the ideal Christian family. Believe me, as I've read my way through the Bible, I have not found one ideal Christian family. Every family I read of in Scripture malfunctions. Every, script, every family I read of in Scripture has horrendous problems. And yet through it all, God was with them. There is no such thing as the ideal Christian family. We are broken people living in a broken world with sorrows in our heart. The second thing to say is this, that these sorrows are, are best worn underneath, not on the top. Did you notice that underneath the royal robe was the hair shirt, was the sackcloth? It wasn't a matter of when the king got up, he put on his royal robe, and then on top of that, he put the sackcloth. No, no, that was hidden. Am I allowed to say this? that there are some people who seem to get great identity in life by perpetually talking about their illnesses and their sorrows. And they kind of just offload them onto everybody else and say, oh, thank you for giving me a listening ear. And then they walk away and we're left with this whacking burden. And sometimes you can come to church and have three or four of those occasions and you go home so depressed thinking, I wish I'd never come this morning because all I've got is people's hair shirts, people's sackcloth and ashes. Now, don't get me wrong, of course there's a time to share. Of course there's a time to, to open up to our friends. And for this king, there was a time when in the end he could take no more and he ripped his garment. But he kind of didn't make a public show of this on a regular basis. No, this was under a unique set of circumstances. And my personal word is this as I read this, is that we should keep these things close to our heart. One of the things the Lord Jesus spoke about in relation to the scribes and Pharisees is that they were great exhibitionists. They were always standing on street corners and uh, praying so that everyone could hear their prayers and their long prayers. And he spoke about their flowing robes and their correct words. Yes, it was all showmanship. Jesus said, when you pray, go in your closet. And when you give, make sure the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And there's a time in our lives when, yes, it's right to speak about our sorrows. There's a time to tear the garment. But always make sure it is your undergarment, never your top garment. Remember those words of Winston Churchill in relation to the late King George VI? Great, great quotation. He said he was sustained not only by his natural buoyancy, but by the sincerity of his Christian faith. During these last months of the king's life, the king walked with death as if death were a companion, an acquaintance whom he recognized and did not fear. Very powerful, isn't it? That sense of just, just quietly accepting the circumstances and just walking in a dignified way, sustained what by? By his strong Christian faith. Many years ago, I, I knew a man who had a very difficult family home situation in relation to one of his children. But the trouble is, every time he spoke to him, he always spoke about this situation. No matter what he spoke about, this situation always cropped up in the conversation. But not just with me, with everybody. Until in the end, he got to a stage where people really didn't want to speak to him because that's all he spoke about. And I remember sitting on one occasion in the college library, because it took place when I was in college, when a senior student, a man in his fifties, took this man on one side and said, Sir, we love you in this college, but why is it every time you talk, you talk about this problem as if it's defining you? He said, your son may have a problem, but it's not you. You're a fine man. He said, why don't you just keep that under wraps more often? Then people perhaps speak to you and, and be more open with you. I thought to myself when I listened to this, for I was eavesdropping, what a brave man he was. And so yes, all of us have situations that are troublesome, they're difficult. Yes, it's the time to reveal them to the right kind of people. But then 
put the garment back. And then we bring our cares and our concerns to the Lord and we let him deal with them. Otherwise, when people see us, instead of the royal robe defining us, it's a sackcloth. And don't forget, the Bible does say that we are children of the King. The third thing to say is this. This helps us empathize. When the king tore his garment and the people saw the, the, the sackcloth underneath, suddenly they realized, we have a king who identifies with us. Maybe at first they thought he didn't, but wait a minute. He is wearing sackcloth. He is wearing a hair shirt. He's feeling the pain of it. Oh yes, he's in a different position from us, but he feels the pain. During my reading, I remember reading, I can't think of whether it was the king of Denmark or the king of Norway. It was one of those two countries where when the Nazis came and invaded during World War II, they imposed that every Jew in that country had to wear a yellow star. And the king, who was a Gentile, said, if they have to wear a yellow star, I'm going to wear one. Well, I'm not a Jew, but I want these people to know I'm identifying with them. I'm standing with them. And isn't that what we get from the king? He's showing us, I don't understand all that's going on, but I want you to know I'm feeling for you. I care for you. Now, as a pastor, I've heard it many times over the years. People have said to me, you know, pastor, you don't, you don't understand. And at one level, they're exactly right. Pastor, you don't understand. You just don't know how I feel. You don't know my pain. Well, I agree, but what do you want me to do? To have all these experiences that I can say, I now understand how you feel. And so yes, I've never had the pain of an unhappy childhood. My home was an ordinary home, it was a Christian home, it wasn't a perfect home, but I was loved and cared for. So I don't know the pain of having a broken home. I don't know the pain of singleness. I've been married for nearly 36 years. I meet people who are single who say, Pastor, you don't understand the pain of being single. Well, no, I don't. Likewise, my wife and I have never had children, so I don't understand the pain of having children who go off the rails. I admit. By the way, I've never taken drugs or alcohol. I don't know the pain of that. I've never gambled in my life. As a child, perhaps, I spent five minutes at a fair on a slot machine. That's, that's the nearest I've come to gambling. I don't know the pain of gambling ripping apart people's homes. Likewise, I've never known the pain of marital infidelity. And so, at one level, you could say, my lines have fallen in pleasant places. And therefore, when people describe these things, no, I don't understand what they're talking about. But wait a minute. Pain is pain. And I could say, and I've had experiences that you know nothing of. And they have given me pain. And pain resonates with pain. If that's not the case, then the best pastors are those who've had drugs, alcohol, marital infidelity, wayward children, you know the kind of stuff? Now that's, that's, not, that's not common sense. That's not being rational. But when you've experienced pain, you can identify with other people's pain. And by the way, we have a saviour who the Bible tells us feels our pain. Can we not say to him, and what do you know about pain? You weren't even married. You didn't have children. By the way, none of your children were on drugs. <laughs> By the way, you've never been unemployed like I've been unemployed. See, once you start going along those lines, you finish up in a very, very narrow cul-de-sac. Pain is pain. And so, yes, the pain of the king was not the pain of those two ladies. And the pain of the king was not the pain of the average person in a street in Samaria. But he knew what pain was. And pain should help us to sympathize, whatever the pain is. There's a great apocryphal story that I, I love. It's of a, a lady who was in her 20s, hadn't married, and she lived with her parents on a farm. And one day they went down to market to uh, do some business. But on the way to market, they were both killed. And partway through the afternoon, there was a knock. When she opened the door, there was an old hag there. 
really haggard, old-looking woman. And, and she was not pleasant to look at. And, and the lady said, are you such a person? Yes, I am. I've come to tell you, your parents are not coming home. They were killed on the way to market. But I've come to live in their place. I don't want you here. Well, I've got to stay here. I've got nowhere else to go. No, I don't want you. No, I'm coming. And so this old hag pushed her way into the house and, and lived in the farmhouse where this girl's parents live. She couldn't get rid of her. When she went to market, she followed her. When she had a day off from the farm, she followed her. When she went on holiday, she was even there. This went on for months. Can't get rid of the woman. One day, she got up and the woman wasn't there. Oh, this is wonderful. Where's she going to? Couldn't find her. Later on that day, there was a knock at the door. And a very attractive young lady was stood at the door. And the young lady said, I've come to replace my mother. Your mother? Yes, the lady who was stopping here. Well, who was your mother? Oh, she was old Mother Sorrow. Oh, and who are you? I'm her daughter, Sympathy. Come in. And is it not true to say when bad things happen to us and, and we feel that we have to rip the garment and people see the pain that's underneath, when that happens, boy, is it ugly. Pain is ugly. Sorrow is ugly. And we can never get rid of it. Even when we come to church, we're singing a hymn, it's there. We're reading the Bible, it's there. We're talking to people, it's there. We sit down and watch some television, it's there. We can't get rid of it. But you know, after time, you discover that sorrow turns to sympathy. And as you then get strength to go about life and you come across people who are living with sorrow, you start to empathize and show a bit of kindness thinking, I haven't had that experience, but I've been there and I feel your pain. And here's the final thing in relation to this. Sadly, Jehoram, he rent his clothes, but he never rent his heart. In terms of showing kindness to his people and identifying with them, you couldn't ask some more, could you? If only he'd done this in relation to the Lord, he was part of the problem. Why was the city under judgment? Because of people like him. Instead of leading the people in the things of God, he was leading them away from the things of God. If only he'd rent his heart as well as his garments, maybe with a slightly different story. Isn't that what Joel spoke about in chapter 2, verse 13 of his prophecy? Rend your hearts, he said to his people, not your garments. Don't make a show of this. God's looking for what's going on on the inside. And so while he was a very caring man, hmm, really didn't touch him spiritually, did it? I suppose a bit like COVID-19. We've seen lots of rending of the garment over these past 10 months. People grieved at the losing of a loved one or maybe the losing of a job and losing of finances. All these different things are in the mix. Don't know about you though, I haven't seen too much rending of the heart before God. I haven't seen people knocking on our church door or ringing our doorbell saying, I need to get right with God if this is so powerful. No, no. People show lots of sympathy to each other, stand on the doorstep, clapping the NHS, singing the virtues of people keeping the shops open. Yeah, but what about your relationship with God? Have you ever thought of rending that heart? Hmm. No. Well, that's King Joram and his sort of message for us today, but wait a minute, there are just a few things I'd like to say before I bring it to a close about, about the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's his king. He does what he does. He's a wicked man, but there are some interesting things I see in this passage that I think can be applied to the Lord Jesus. Let me just say what they are. Number one, the Lord Jesus is a man of sorrows. He was, and I've said this carefully, please don't take me out of context, surely he still is. It's interesting when you open the scriptures of the Lord Jesus, He's spoken about, he's spoken about as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And you certainly see that in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew what pain was. He came to earth, not as an aloof saviour, but he came as one of us. That's the whole part of the incarnation. The incarnation literally means to step into flesh. 
And uh, when you read John writing at the end of the New Testament, he says he was one of us. We handled him, we touched him. In fact, when George Stevenson died, the creator of Stevenson's rocket, he, he was buried in Chesterfield. And as the funeral procession was being led through the streets of Chesterfield, his, his engineers and his workers carried a huge banner which said he was one of us. He wasn't some sort of high and mighty mechanical engineer removed from the workshop. No, he was one of us. And the whole point of the incarnation is this, that God came to earth in Jesus Christ and was one of us, and he came as a man of sorrows. That's why he could stand outside the tomb of Lazarus and he could weep. That's why he could look over Jerusalem and weep. And I've lost count on the number of occasions it says in the Gospels that when the Lord Jesus stepped into a certain situation, he was moved with compassion. Splanknizomai. It's a powerful Greek word. It means to show it in your eyes. Show it in your eyes. How did the disciples know he was moved with compassion? Did he say to them, by the way, this really moves me? They could see it in his whole demeanor. This man is moved. And my dear friends, when Jesus came to earth, he was moved by the people and their plight. That's why people ran to him with their children. That's why people ran to him with their problems. Why well, they knew they were going to a man who cared. And so Jesus came to earth as a man of sorrows. He dealt with people's sorrows. Do you think he still has sorrows today? Of course he has. We've got to kind of balance this out. I know that with, with his understanding of what's going on in the world. Do you think that he rejoices in the way the way the world is going? Do you think that Lord Jesus is cock a hoop about the state of the church? No. He was a man of sorrows and he still is a man of sorrows. But secondly, I would say a lot of his sorrows are underneath the garments. Oh yes, Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. When you read the book of Revelation, you read that very, very powerfully. He, he's the lamb upon the throne. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the one coming up, riding on the white charger, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes, of course, he's in total control. But who knows what's going on in his heart? Will we ever understand God? No. Some people have a strange idea about heaven, that when we get to heaven, everything will all be revealed. We'll know everything. We won't. God is God. Who can understand God? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And by the way, who could ever understand what was going on in the heart of God at Calvary? Remember that hymn, None of the Ransomed Ever Knew? How deep were the waters crossed? How dark was the night that our Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that were lost? Who can ever fathom how painful it was for him to go through Calvary? Well, we have a little glimpse into it here and there in Scripture. But who knows what was going on there? Nobody knows. And yet it's there, hidden. And there are many things in the heart and mind of God that we know nothing of. We don't worship a God who's devoid of feelings. Otherwise, we're given the impression we're worshiping a block of stout. God has a heart. And we see that heart in Jesus, walking around and caring for people, but we see that heart broken at Calvary. Thirdly, but he does care for us. I find that so refreshing. Here's the king, Joram. He was a godless man, but underneath his royal robe, he had sackcloth. He cared for his people. I'm moved by their plight. And here's the Lord Jesus, king of kings, lord of lords. He has a heart. He cares for people. We don't fully understand the depth of his pain, but we certainly understand a little bit. We think about it, surely, in some of our hymns. And, and our singing of these hymns is based on the verse we find in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, uh, and verse 15. We have a high priest who is touched, touched with the feelings of our infirmities. I mean, what's, what's the author of Hebrews telling us? That there's a man in heaven, our great high priest, who is better than Aaron, better than all the high priests. After the order of Melchizedek, we have a priest in heaven who is touched with the feelings of 
our infirmities. And because of that, Michael Bruce wrote these lovely words that we sometimes sing here in every pang that rends the heart, the man of sorrows has a part. And F.W. Faber, oh, I love this. There is no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. Do you not think God cares? Of course he cares about us. Of course he cares about the church. Of course he cares about the world. You say, yeah, but he's king of kings. I know he is. But also he's our great high priest who came to earth as one of us. He knows what it's about and he cares for us. Then we have that glorious statement at the end of 1 Peter chapter 5 where Peter says to his people, listen, casting all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. The thing about Jehoram is that he did care for his people. If he really, really cared, he'd have got on his knees before God and said, sorry, but putting that aside, he did care for his people, but he could do nothing about it. The great thing about our king is that he has a heart, he has pain, the like of which some of us don't understand, but he cares and does something about it. He says, cast your care upon me. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will answer. And one final thought. My final thought is this. Calvary reveals all. We all know that Jesus was crucified. He was pinned to a tree. For three hours from nine o'clock in the morning till noon, we have man doing what he can to the Son of God, abusing him, mocking him, belittling him, blaspheming him. And then at 12 o'clock, God drew a curtain around Calvary. He surrounded the place with darkness. And there, in the dark, unknown to us what was fully going on, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. When it was all over, Jesus shouted out, it is finished. What happened next? What happened next? I'll tell you, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. We know from a human point of view that is telling us access into the presence of God is now available, drawn near. But from the other side, God is tearing the veil to let us know that underneath the robe of deity and royalty, there is the heart of God. I'm revealing it to the world. What does Calvary show us? What do we see through the torn veil? That God has a heart, and a heart that is prepared to suffer, that we may have eternal life. If I, have you ever thought about this? It's only true love that suffers. Because when you love, you open your heart. And when you open your heart, you run the risk of people hurting that open heart. And at Calvary, God opened the veil. He opened his heart. And when we look, we say, even the king has a heart touched with sorrow. But he's done something about it. He's paid the price for our sin. Well, there we are then. That's 2 Kings, chapter 6, verse 30. Interesting verse, isn't it? Very relevant to where we are. I simply say to you, on this Sunday morning in January, you got sorrows, so have I. Keep them as your underclothes, not as your top clothes. Talk to the Lord about it. He too knows what it is to have sorrows. He's torn his clothes to show it. Calvary reveals it all. But thank God, we have a God who can do something about it. Sometimes he takes those sorrows away. More often than not, he gives us the grace to cope. And I tell you this, after being a Christian for 46 years, he's a wonderful God. And he has a wonderful son. And I thank God 
for the Holy Spirit. I'd be lost without my Savior. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you in the precious name of Jesus for this passage. Interesting. Lord, I just pray especially for those who underneath their posh, smart exterior have a hair shirt or are wearing sackcloth for whatever reason. Father, I give you thanks. When we look at your son, we see a saviour who has a heart, who cares and who understands. And even when we look at the cross, vile though it is in the sense that we see our sin placed upon your son, amidst all that and the pain that that brought, we can see a torn garment and see a beating heart, the heart of a God who so loved that he gave people like us his only begotten son. Father, thank you for Jesus. What a wonderful, wonderful saviour. Lord, take hold of these words. What can be used? Use it for the glory of your name and the building up of your people. What is of me? Just wash it out of our minds. Because I ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.